Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, still in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. You no doubt realize by now that great speakers and speeches will remain fully online during the fall semester. So I am preparing a video version of each lecture for the class and making all the lessons available on YouTube. Enjoy the lecture. So now we turn to a period six years after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln to look at a speech by Victoria Claflin Woodhull entitled Constitutional Equality. It was the first speech delivered by a woman before a congressional committee of the United States Congress. Victoria California Claflin was born in 1838 on the 23rd of September in Homer, Ohio. You might say that's an unusual middle name, but in fact, her sister's first name was Tennessee. Victoria Claflin had only three years of formal schooling, and in 1853, at the age of 15, she married Canning Woodhull, who was the family physician. Some historians believe she was actually abducted by Woodhull and forced into marriage. In 1864, she divorced Woodhull, although kept his name, and became an advocate of free love. This was not a philosophy of sexual immorality or widespread promiscuity, but rather the advocacy of divorce rights for women, and in a more general way, the idea that it should be up to women themselves to decide whether or not they engage in sexual relationships. In 1866, she married again, this time to James Blood, and in 1870, she and her sister became the first female stockbrokers in America when they opened up a brokerage firm on Wall Street with the financial support of Cornelius Vanderbilt. That same year, taking some of the proceeds of their successful Wall Street trading, they began Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly which was a periodical that supported women's rights. Also in 1870, she declared her candidacy for President of the United States, even though this was 50 years before women gained the right to vote in America. Now, she declared her candidacy for the 1872 election by sending a letter to the editor of the New York Herald which was published on the 29th of March, 1870. And you see a portion of that letter in the upper right-hand corner of the slide here. Later, in 1872, she received the official nomination of the Equal Rights Party, and Frederick Douglass was chosen as her running mate, although Frederick Douglass never participated in the campaign. It may seem interesting to learn that someone who was obviously a powerful advocate for women's rights in the 19th century was nevertheless a strong opponent of abortion. In 1870, Victoria Woodhull wrote in Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly that many women who would be shocked at the very thought of killing their children after birth deliberately destroy them previously. If there is any difference in the actual crime, we should be glad to have those who practice the latter pointed out. The truth of the matter is that it is just as much a murder to destroy life in its embryotic condition as it is to destroy it after the fully developed form is attained, for it is the self-same life that is taken. Now, in 1871, Victoria Woodhull became the first woman to speak before a congressional committee and she delivered that Constitutional Equality Address, which will be the subject of our study today. Also, later that year, she delivered what became known as the Steinway Speech, thus named because of the venue, the Steinway Auditorium, where it was delivered in New York. It was a speech that outlined her philosophy of free love. And as we mentioned, in 1872, she received the official nomination for president of the Equal Rights Party with Frederick Douglass as her running mate. But also in 1872, she was arrested on obscenity charges for publishing details about a scandalous affair that took place, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. 
1876, again consistent with her free love philosophy, she divorced her second husband, James Blood, and in 1877 she moved to Great Britain. There is some interesting speculation about the reason for her departure from the United States. Some historians speculate that she may have been induced to leave the United States by the Vanderbilt family following the death of Cornelius Vanderbilt. They believe that because of their business dealings that Woodhull may have made some claims against the Vanderbilt estate and so they paid her a significant sum of money to leave the United States. In 1883 she married John Martin in England and in 1892 began publishing another periodical entitled The Humanitarian. Victoria Woodhull died on the 9th of June 1927 in England. Now we mentioned earlier Victoria Woodhull's arrest on obscenity charges because she published in her newspaper details of the Beecher Tilton adultery scandal and here in fact is the newspaper that was the cause of her arrest. In that scandal, Theodore Tilton, who's depicted here on the left, and his wife Elizabeth, depicted here on the right on the top, belonged to the congregation of Henry Ward Beecher, depicted below. Beecher began having an adulterous affair with Elizabeth Tilton, and it was discovered by Theodore Tilton. Beecher had been one of the critics of Woodhull's free love philosophy, and Woodhull thought it was great hypocrisy for him to denounce free love and yet engage in adultery himself. And so she published a full account of the adulterous affair with Elizabeth Tilton in her newspaper. Beecher ultimately was tried and acquitted of adultery. So let's take a look at the constitutional equality speech that Victoria Woodhull delivers in early 1871 before the United States House of Representatives Judiciary Committee. And so we'll ask first what is the genre of the speech and then what is its rhetorical situation, the exigence, the audience, and the constraints. Because we recognize that the speech is being delivered before a legislative committee, that tells us that it is a deliberative speech, and indeed the argument is in favor of making changes in the laws so that women gain the right to vote. The exigence here, too, is somewhat clear and simple in the sense that Woodhull wants to persuade members of her immediate audience, that is, the members of the Judiciary Committee, to support alteration in the United States laws so that they recognize a female citizen's right to vote. It is, in a larger sense, an attempt by her with rhetorical discourse to alleviate what she considers to be a grave injustice against female citizens in the United States. So who is her audience here? Obviously, the members of the House Judiciary Committee are the immediate audience not only are they the ones who might be persuaded by her speech, but they are also the ones who have the authority and the power to vote or at least to advocate for the changes that she's recommending. And then what are the constraints on her in this circumstance? Certainly the fact that she's female works against her. We are still in a period of time in American history when women did not generally speak or be involved in American politics. And so there's a prejudice against her because she is a woman. In fact, if you read some of the newspaper accounts of her appearance before the Judiciary Committee, you see that some of the newspapers mock her presentation. And indeed, some of the members of Congress do that also in their remarks as they appear in the Congressional Globe. And so because of the prejudice against her and against the idea of women voting and participating in politics, she needs to find arguments and appeals which will overcome that kind of opposition. So she considers who her audience is, what their values and core beliefs are, and so she's going to try to use those basic commitments as the substance of her speech. I think we also can see that because there would have been an impression that women 
in the 19th century were perhaps more emotional than men that we see Woodhull adopting a strategy of strict logical deduction of close reasoning in her speech to the members of the committee. So here are some of the critical questions we can pose about the speech. Notice here in this illustration that Victoria Woodhull is referred to as the notorious Victoria Woodhull and Jenny, it should have been Tenny because her, uh, the sister's name was Tennessee, the notorious Victoria Woodhull and Tenny Claflin present their votes at the poll at New York City and are denied the exercise of the ballot. But what critical questions can we ask about the Victoria Woodhull speech? First, how would you account for Woodhull's very close logical argument in her address? What advantage does careful reasoning afford her? And I think we've begun to address that already in connection with constraints. So look at the way in which she argues in the speech and see that in part as a response or a strategy adopted in response to her rhetorical situation. Then we could also ask, what is the particular form of argument or what Aristotle would call the argumentative topic that is most in evidence in Woodhull's address. That is, how does Victoria Woodhull argue? What's the form of argument that she uses? Why does Woodhull rely chiefly on inartistic proofs? That is, what proofs does she use and why are those the most effective? So let's look at the sources of the evidence that she uses in her arguments. So you'll see she isn't just crafting arguments of her own invention, but she is attaching her argument to certain kinds of documentary evidence. Well, what kinds of documents is she using and where do those documents come from? Why is she selecting those particular forms of proof to aid her argument? Now, before we look at the text of the speech, Let's take a look at this article by Jason Jones entitled, Breathing Life into a Public Woman, Victoria Woodhull's Defense of Woman Suffrage. And again, it's helpful sometimes to begin with the abstract, which says here, relying on a rhetorical strategy known as the New Departure, Victoria Woodhull went before the House Judiciary Committee in 1871 to defend woman's suffrage. Although her address captured the respect of her contemporaries, Woodhull's contribution to the fight for woman suffrage has yet to be recognized. As she displayed rhetorical competence in a once exclusively male rhetorical space, Woodhull embodied the subjectivity of a public woman for her immediate and extended audiences. So it is perhaps important here to reflect on what is known as the new departure strategy represented in Victoria Woodhull's speech. That new departure strategy it is a new departure for the woman suffrage campaign. Previously, they have been advocating that Congress grant women the right to vote or extend voting rights to women. But the new departure strategy instead, and this came mainly after the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments following the Civil War, the new departure strategy said that under these new amendments to the Constitution, women were granted and already possessed the right to vote. It simply is a matter of exercising that right. And so you'll see in part that Victoria Woodhull makes the argument in her speech that those amendments to the Constitution, in fact, accomplished the extension of voting rights to women. And so she's simply asking that the members of the Congressional Committee recognize that and pass laws accordingly. Jones goes on to argue that Woodhull deserves more attention from rhetorical critics and historians. Woodhull enriches our understanding of a dynamic rhetorical strategy that she, Anthony, meaning Susan B. Anthony, and the miners, Francis and Virginia Minor, and those who preceded the miners employed in various ways for a common cause 
women's rights. And the strategy he's referring to here is that new departure strategy. Furthermore, Woodhull's address marks one of the many moments when the seemingly impermeable boundaries of 19th century gender conventions appeared, albeit briefly, porous and arbitrary, as she spoke in a rhetorical space from which women were formally excluded. And so, as is often the case in critical and historical studies of public address, we see an author, Jones in this case, making an argument for the significance of the text that he is studying. He goes on to point out that Jacqueline Jones Royster argues that female speakers had to demonstrate what she calls rhetorical competence, a base of sociocultural knowledge and language experience, as communicators usually do, which they use in the process of making meaning and conveying that meaning to others in the satisfaction of specific purposes. So here Jones is referring to one of the constraints on Woodhull, that because she's a woman, perhaps they anticipated she would be incapable of engaging in convincing rhetoric, so she has this greater challenge or higher expectation placed upon her. But she also has the challenge of essentially invading what had been a traditionally male space with her rhetorical arguments. There were, as Jones points out, perceptions of who is allowed to speak in particular rhetorical spaces, but also how messages are communicated within them. Woodhull managed to negotiate the tension between the feminine rhetorical space that she was supposed to occupy and the masculine rhetorical space into which she was admitted by demonstrating her rhetorical competence for speaking before the house. So again, we can go back to the strategies that we observe in the speech and see whether those strategies are chosen in part because they were the strategies expected for rhetoric in a male domain. Jones also observes that Woodhull's audience included not only influential members of the committee, but also prominent women such as Isabella Beecher Hooker, Susan B. Anthony, Paulina Wright Davis, and others. Woodhull's planning could not have been better. She, with Butler's assistance, talking about Congressman Butler from Massachusetts, one of those who supported her advocacy of women's voting rights, she, with Butler's assistance, had the opportunity to stand before high-ranking politicians and women's eyes to argue for woman suffrage. If man cannot speak for her, man can certainly get her access to rhetorical spaces in which her voice can be heard by those who can effect change. And that's really the definition of a rhetorical audience, those who could be persuaded and could affect change or who could do something within their power to mitigate the rhetorical exigence. And then Jones reflects on one of the challenges of dealing with texts from an age before electronic recording devices. In addition to the humble statements she utters in her introduction, her voice may have served as a disarming tool as well. Having to work with only the written word of 19th century speeches, rhetorical analyses are often limited by the inability to fully capture the prosodic elements of a rhetor's address. Fortunately, there are extant observations of Woodhull's delivery. And so then he turns to one of the original sources describing how she spoke. She looked so pale, they wondered if she were going to faint. And when she began to read, her voice trembled and broke. Suddenly her face flushed, it lighted, beauty gilded it. Her voice cleared and gathered deep musical tones. And then Jones recognizes, as we suggested earlier, that Woodhull turns to certain founding documents as her inartistic proofs. By beginning with the truths of the founding documents rather than what opponents would have seen as the assumption of women's citizenship, Woodhull lays down a stronger foundation upon which she can build her claims. Through this strategy, Woodhull couches her language about women and citizenship suffrage, 
in the language of the founding documents to ally women's cause with the principles upon which American democracy is purportedly based. Further, her knowledge of the documents enables her to display her rhetorical competence for communicating effectively in a supposedly masculine rhetorical space that requires members to possess such knowledge. So let's take a look ourselves at the text of Victoria Woodhull's speech on constitutional equality. And we want to begin with a memorial that is essentially the petition that Victoria Woodhull sent to the Congress in December of 1870, asking for them to address this injustice of denying women the right to vote. And we see first in the petition, which she references in the beginning of her speech, we see first in the petition the beginnings of the argument that she's going to make. We note that she begins by establishing her standing as a citizen of Ohio and then later of New York, that she is 21 years old and so possesses all the prerequisites necessary for anyone who wishes to vote. And she notes that since the adoption of Article 15 of the amendments to the Constitution, neither the state of New York nor any other state nor any territory has passed any law to abridge the right of any citizen of the United States to vote as established by said article, neither on account of sex or otherwise. And then she points out that nevertheless, the right to vote is denied to women citizens of the United States by the operation of election laws in the several states. And this is the key issue that she addresses in her speech. She believes, again, according to that new departure strategy, that the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, in fact, acknowledges women citizens have the right to vote. But the existing electoral laws in New York and the other states deny women that right to vote, despite what the 15th Amendment says. She goes on to say in the petition, and whereas no distinction between citizens is made in the Constitution of the United States on account of sex, therefore your memorialist, that is Victoria Woodhull herself, your memorialist would most respectfully petition your honorable bodies to make such laws as in the wisdom of Congress shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the right vested by the Constitution in the citizens of the United States to vote without regard to sex. So this is the petition that she sends ahead of her meeting with the Judiciary Committee. She sends the petition. The petition is introduced in Congress. It is ordered to be printed and to be sent to the Judiciary Committee for consideration. When the petition comes up in the committee, she is granted the right to speak on the petition. And so then in speaking to the committee, she reminds them that one portion of citizens have no power to deprive another portion of rights and privileges such are possessed and exercised by themselves. The male citizen has no more right to deprive the female citizen of the free public political expression of opinion than the female citizen has to deprive the male citizen thereof. And here she is using a basic reciprocity argument or an argument based on natural equity. That is, if men and women should be considered equally citizens, then they should enjoy equal rights and privileges, including, of course, the right to vote. She goes on to say that the Constitution defines a woman born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof to be a citizen. It recognizes the right of citizens to vote. It declares that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So Woodhull is recognizing here under that new departure strategy, first of all, that the 14th Amendment guarantees equal justice and equal application of the laws to all citizens. 
and that the 15th Amendment, which grants the right to vote to former slaves, must also then be taken to apply to all citizens. That is, no state can make a law which denies the right of any citizen to vote. And women, of course, are citizens. Notice here also the process of her logical reasoning here. She's establishing one claim and then using that claim as the premise for a subsequent argument as she works through the steps of inference to get to the claim that women then are entitled to vote. But the right to vote, she says, has only lately been distinctly declared by the Constitution to be inalienable under three distinct conditions, in all of which woman is distinctly embraced. The citizen who is taxed should also have a voice in the subject matter of taxation. No taxation without representation is a right which was fundamentally established at the very birth of our country's independence. And by what ethics does any free government impose taxes on women without giving them a voice upon the subject or a participation in the public declaration as to how and by whom these taxes shall be applied for common public use? So here again, we see Woodhull turning to the founding of the nation, especially that slogan of no taxation without representation, which we saw even James Otis using way back in 1761. But here, invoked by Woodhull as another argument in favor, a traditional argument, an American argument, a historical argument in favor of women not being taxed without the right to vote. You can't have a representative if you are not entitled to vote for those representatives. And yet women indeed are taxed, so they are taxed without representation. She goes on to say that women constitute a majority of the people of this country. They hold vast portions of the nation's wealth and pay a proportionate share of the taxes. They are entrusted with the most holy duties and the most vital responsibilities of society. They bear, rear, and educate men. They train and mold their characters. They inspire the noblest impulses in men. They often hold the accumulated fortunes of a man's life for the safety of the family and as guardians of the infants. And yet they are debarred from uttering any opinion by public vote as to the management by public servants of these interests. They are the secret counselors, the best advisors, the most devoted aides in the most trying periods of men's lives, and yet men shrink from trusting them in the common questions of ordinary politics. And so here, Woodhull obviously pointing out the contradictions in the way women are entrusted in so many ways and yet not trusted in politics. There's a degree of hypocrisy in the attitudes of those who oppose woman suffrage. She continues, the American nation in its march onward and upward cannot paralyze the intellectual and political activity of half its citizens by narrow statutes. The will of the entire people is the true basis of Republican government and a free expression of that will by the public vote of all citizens without distinctions of race, color, occupation, or sex is the only means by which that will can be ascertained. As the world has advanced in civilization and culture, as mind has risen in its dominion over matter, as the principle of justice and moral right has gained sway and merely physical organized power has yielded thereto, as the might of right has supplanted the right of might, so have the rights of women become more fully recognized and that recognition is the result of the development of the minds of men, which through the ages she has polished and thereby heightened the luster of civilization. And so here we see Woodhull with her language reaching for those levels of oratorical eloquence, perhaps again anticipating that this would be impressive to members of the all-male House Judiciary Committee. 
but we see her expressing those sentiments with great feeling and with great imagery here toward the end of her speech. And so she concludes and says, therefore, believing firmly in the right of citizens to freely approach those in whose hands their destiny is placed under the providence of God, your memorialist has frankly but humbly appealed to you and prays that the wisdom of Congress may be moved to action in this matter for the benefit and the increased happiness of our beloved country. And so again, a rather elegant and commanding, a powerful peroration to the brief speech that she gives to the House Judiciary Committee, the first speech by a woman to any such committee in the history of the United States. So there is a look at Victoria Woodhull's speech on constitutional equality from 1871. If you have a question or a comment on Woodhull or her address, please post them to the discussion board.